on this Saturday night, Truth and Reconciliation. Canadians reflect on the shameful legacy of residential schools. I would encourage us to double our efforts in advancing reconciliation. Plus, the efforts to confront residential school denialists. Students attacking teachers. There's been a couple of cases of weapons being brought into schools. The trend is, is definitely growing. The new warning about a terrifying trend. American funding for Ukraine. Why Kyiv finds itself at the center of a fight on Capitol Hill as U.S. lawmakers race to avoid a government shutdown. Plus, stealing the show. Even than the, real thing. the new Vegas venue that moves in mysterious ways. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. A sea of orange across Canada today as thousands gathered from coast to coast to coast to mark the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, raising awareness about the legacy and lasting impact of Canada's residential school system, which caused generations of pain and suffering for Indigenous people. Today, those communities are reflecting on the past while demanding a better future. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The third annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation was marked with marches, songs and powwows across Canada. One of the largest events was held in Ottawa, where Indigenous heritage and resilience took centre stage on Parliament Hill. Our David Baxter was there and begins our coverage tonight. For decades, these schools tried to carry out their mission to kill the Indian within the child. We are here today because they failed. A sea of orange shirts covers Parliament Hill as Canadians are called to reflect on a troubling part of our history, the residential school system. It's something Laurie McDonald is all too familiar with. The abuse you suffered in there, especially sexual abuse, you think uh, it's your fault and that's what you're led to believe. So you don't go home. McDonald says it took him 60 years to truly return home to the Enoch Cree Nation. Now, seeing all the orange shirts, he knows he isn't walking the healing road alone. I may be on this journey of healing, and that healing will stop when the Creator decides to take me home. But in the meantime, I'm not walking alone on this journey anymore. Now, Indigenous musicians, some of the culture residential schools tried to stamp out, play outside the Parliament building where those policies were drafted. A proud people who could not be destroyed. Canada's residential school history was long suppressed, so events like this are a valuable tool for descendants of those survivors to connect with their past. We're still uh, reconnecting and, and trying to find out more about that history, but really to honour our ancestors and be proud of, of being an Indigenous person. Still, thousands who went to residential schools never got to have their own families. This cloth bears the name of over 4,000 children who never came home. More children will be found and their names will be added. And that's why you see a lot of families, a lot of parents, a lot of children, a lot of youth in the state that they're in today is because a direct result of the parents losing the children. The creation of this day is part of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but more still needs to be done to heal communities. David Baxter, Global News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister marked the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation at an event in Saskatchewan. Justin Trudeau joined Indigenous leaders and community members in a march through the town of La Ronge. In a speech, he referred to Canada as Turtle Island, the name used by some Indigenous peoples. And he criticized those who were trying to downplay the lasting impacts of residential schools. And there are many who uh, would like us to simply brush over the past and pretend it didn't happen because they feel that talking about truth and reconciliation, marking this day, somehow diminishes us. Reconciliation is the action and the responsibility of every single person who lives today on Turtle Island. 
As the country remembers that dark chapter of history, the search for answers continues. An estimated 150,000 children were placed in schools designed to erase their culture. Now, so far, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has documented the deaths of more than 4,000 Indigenous children in residential schools across Canada, but it estimates that 6,000 or more may have died. Many First Nations are now trying to locate their lost children. Not every search has found remains. And as Melissa Ridgen explains, that's fueling misinformation. It's a grim but necessary task. We want to share with the world that we can confirm that 67 students passed away. 40 unmarked children's graves. Shallow graves. Only large enough for the young bodies to lay in the fetal position. The 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report warned Canada of thousands of unmarked graves at former residential schools across the country. The search to find and identify those children now underway. Regardless of the number of children who died at residential school, kids shouldn't die at school. There is no one in Canada that sends their kid to school today knowing that there's a chance of them not coming home. Brenda Gunn is a Métis lawyer and research director at the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. She says it will be a years-long process and not every search will find remains. This summer, Minigazibi and Anishinaabe First Nation in Manitoba hired a forensic team to excavate 14 anomalies detected by ground-penetrating radar inside a church basement. There's always been stories told from, from elders and those who have passed on about what happened here. No human remains were found. This excavation is but a small piece of a much larger truth. The results in Pine Creek are not a means to deny the truths of those who survived the residential school experience and those who did not. While it was a relief to many in the community, it fueled residential school denialists. An interim report by Canada's special interlocutor, whose mandate is to help communities as they navigate the search for graves, highlighted this problem. Kimberly Murray wrote of denialists entering the Kamloops residential school grave site in the middle of the night, carrying shovels. They said they wanted to see for themselves if children were buried there. The First Nation has had to hire around-the-clock security to protect the site while the community decides what to do with the children buried there. It's really unfortunate that people use this moment in time where we're still trying to gather exact details to try to undermine the experiences of survivors at residential school. Gunn says after the years of work to identify and to rule out graves, communities will need to decide whether to leave them resting or to relocate them. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Winnipeg. There is support for survivors, a 24-hour crisis line for anyone experiencing pain or distress as a result of their residential school experience. You can call toll-free and speak in confidence at 1-800-721-0066. A new poll shows most Canadians believe more should be done to recognize the legacy of residential schools. That data from Ipsos shows about 70% of Canadians believe governments and individuals should do more, but only about 55% of Canadians believe there will be meaningful reconciliation in their lifetime. To help with that healing, in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommended 94 calls to action, and some of those steps focused specifically on health care. Catherine Ward spoke to doctors to hear their perspective on what progress is being made. As an Indigenous woman, I'm very aware that every day that I'm in medical school, I'm working in a system that was not made for me. Kelsey Allen feels family medicine could be her calling. The second-year medical student hopes to eventually serve her community, Halpu First Nation, back home in Newfoundland. It's very important to me that, as an Indigenous doctor, getting my medical education, that I do not come out on the other side of a medical conveyor belt as another Western doctor who is Indigenous. I want to be an Indigenous doctor who practices holistic medicine and who acknowledges that someone is more than just their symptoms or their disease. Dr. Michael Dumont has navigated that tension throughout his career. I now feel that I practice in my, in my work is, is more of a two-eyed seeing approach um, in the care that I provide as a doctor. There might be much more of a um, 
a, a culturally infused sort of interaction. You know, the elders and the traditional healers might be in the visit with us. We might be doing that in our healing room rather than in a, in a medical sort of office like the one I'm in right now. Dr. Alika Lafontaine is a past president of the Canadian Medical Association. He says representation is improving. I'm seeing more and more folks go into specialties that are needed within Indigenous communities across the country. But barriers still exist, especially for students just starting their careers. The many students face is that they're forced to be not only in the learner role, but in the educator role for their peers. Um, you know, when we're in circumstances where, you know, we're being taught um, Indigenous health content in our curriculum, um, oftentimes that entails some really uncomfortable questions. Kelsey says she prioritizes finding peace amidst the intensity of the program. While remaining committed to being part of a change she hopes will last for generations. I think about hopefully in three generations time we'll have so much more capacity and we'll have created a safe space that welcomes as many Indigenous people as want to be doctors. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Every child matters. A little later on the program, we'll take a look at how Indigenous youth are commemorating Truth and Reconciliation Day and their efforts to educate the next generation. Turning now to a Global News investigation looking into reports of violence in Canadian schools. Multiple teachers unions say reports of student violence against teachers are on the rise. And without proper supports, they're worried that problem will only get worse. Naomi Bargale reports. Death threats, head injuries and even poisoning. That is just some of the violence being reported by Canadian teachers in recent months. It's really shocking. Multiple unions across the country say the trend of student violence against teachers has been growing for the past five years, but reached new levels since students returned to in-person classes a year ago. There's been a couple of cases of weapons being brought into schools. Um, the trend is, is definitely growing. Beacott says in the first two weeks of the school year, there were already multiple reports of teachers being stabbed with pencils. It's, it's a lot of incidents and it's uh, very concerning. Several regions across the country are also experiencing a shortage of teachers. The president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation says as violent incidents become more frequent, more teachers are leaving their positions altogether. We don't have a teacher shortage, we have a shortage of good working conditions and that comes back down to the safety in the schools. Unions in four provinces, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario and Nova Scotia, tell Global News funding is playing a big role in why this kind of behaviour is worsening. In Saskatchewan, funding per student has been declining for decades, while student enrollment keeps climbing. Beacott says that without early support, it's tough to prevent violent acts in the future. Although we're talking about violence that is uh, um, happening from a student to a teacher, uh, we really don't feel that it is the student's fault because in many of these cases, um, they just haven't been provided the supports necessary uh, to, to know how to express their emotions and express their frustration in, in an appropriate way. Teacher union reps fear the number of incidents occurring is likely higher than reported. They said part of the reason is that teachers assume reporting won't lead to action or in some cases be asked to show how they could have prevented the violence. Global News reached out to all 13 provincial and territorial education ministries asking for data on incident reports filed by teachers experiencing violence. Only one shared their data for the past year. Naomi Bargell, Global News. Down to the wire. Coming up, with hours to go until a U.S. government shutdown, the House passes a spending bill without funding for Ukraine. All eyes are on the U.S. Senate tonight after the House of Representatives voted in favor of passing a stopgap funding bill, a key step to avoiding a government shutdown. On this vote, the yeas are 335, the nays are 91, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.
The 45-day short-term spending resolution includes natural disaster relief, but no additional funding for Ukraine, a White House priority that's opposed by a number of Republican lawmakers. With just hours to go before a midnight deadline to fund the government, the bill still needs to pass the Senate. If it does not pass in time and the government shuts down, those in the military will be forced to work without pay, and federal works will face furloughs impacting programs and services that thousands of Americans rely on. Well, Las Vegas is known to put on a good show, but the city is taking that spectacle to a whole new level with the inaugural concert at The Sphere. Even better than the real thing. U2 kicked off their 25-show residency at the high-tech, globe-shaped venue. Inside The Sphere, an LED screen wraps halfway around the audience, immersing the crowd. That sphere cost over $2 billion to build. The venue's exterior is also covered with LEDs. Still ahead, the view from the front lines of the wildfire fight in BC. This year's historic wildfire season has been exhausting and punishing for firefighters across Canada. That fight is the focus of our Global News current affairs program, The New Reality, which is back with a new season and a new host. Carolyn Jarvis has a preview of the premiere episode with a rare look at the front lines of the firefight. Our crew spent three days with BC Wildfire Service this summer as they persevered through a difficult season with so many unknowns. Adam Buchanan, a member of the BC Wildfire Service and a former fire investigator, took correspondent Nithu Garcha to a barren landscape littered with charred trees, dried soil and seared holes. He explained that even though you can't see it, fires can still burn underground. To me, this looks like an animal burrow. It's not that. What are these holes? When the fire moved through here, it consumed the stump and also burnt all the roots. And so the fire will not just consume everything on top like we can see, but it also moves its way and finds whatever vegetation is available to burn underneath. And so when we're putting this out, it takes a lot longer because we can't just spray water on the top. We have to come and check these and, and this could still be burning. 10, 12, 15 feet down any one of these roots that we're looking at. Wow, so we were deemed safe to come to this area. How did we know that there wouldn't be a hot spot? The only way to know for sure is to get in there with our hands, feel it, see if it's hot, and if it is, then spend some time to make sure we put it out. In our program, we also learn about how the acceleration of climate change is amplifying the length and severity of fire seasons. Experts are calling for fire mitigation techniques such as prescribed burning to be significantly increased. To hear more about those strategies and the firefight, watch the season premiere of The New Reality tonight at 7 on Global. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News. Up next, Indigenous children reflect on a dark past and look to a brighter future. Work is now underway in British Columbia to re-erect a memorial totem pole that was taken without the First Nations consent nearly a century ago. The 11-meter pole was returned from the National Museum of Scotland yesterday. It's expected to take several days to re-erect. That community is hoping to use the totem pole as an educational tool for generations to come. Our Nithu Garcha spent time with some of Nisga Nation's youth on this Truth and Reconciliation Day as the community looks forward to what they hope is a brighter future. It can't be emphasized enough. The message behind a movement with so much meaning for these students and teachers of Niska Elementary Secondary School resonates deeply for Yvette McMillan. It lifts me up, it lifts my heart up because I'm an Indian Day School survivor. The Niska language teacher says seeing these children walk with such honor, pride and joy helps deliver a message to her inner child. Don't give up, there's hope in the future. I have attended this school myself from kindergarten to grade 12 and I went to grade one in this exact same classroom where I am teaching grade one. For Lena Griffin on this National Truth and Reconciliation Day, she's thinking of her relatives who went to residential school and her mother. 
she was in a TB hospital, which unfortunately was the same, the same abuse. Griffin believes creating a safe space for children today doesn't mean shielding them from honest conversations about the historic and present day effects of the institutions of assimilation. They know that healing needs to happen. And when we include them in those conversations, that's when it starts to happen. Yeah, your Oatly and your Gigi, they both went. And what happened to that orange shirt, Jace, do you remember? It had been taken away it was given back. It was taken away and never given back. Why? Why? That's a very good question, why? They're exploring the big question of why Phyllis Webstad, founder of Orange Shirt Day, had hers taken away. Every child matters! Sit up tall and proud, and when we breathe in, we're going to say, Anneen. I am a good person. As these children are constantly reminded of their value. Nitu Garcia, Global News, Niska Nation. That future is looking bright. That is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Thanks for watching. We leave you tonight with more from Canada's national ceremony on this day of truth and reconciliation, which included a banner with the names of thousands of kids who never made it home from residential schools.